Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I've been diving into the recommended videos over on Discord. We have a channel where you can suggest videos for reactions. There's some great ones there. There's a few that I probably can't do because of copyright reasons and things like that, but all great suggestions. We're actually going to take one of those suggestions today. Uh, and this one comes from our friend Indy Nidell, who I know is a subscriber. Uh, of vlogging through history. Hey, shout out to you, Indy. Hopefully we'll connect one of these days and be able to collab on something. Um, but this is his video from the Great War channel. If you want to see his more current stuff, he's currently part of the Time Ghost team doing the videos on World War II week by week. And I know he's going to be in Normandy here uh, doing a fantastic production uh, coming up here in just a few weeks for D-Day. Uh, and I'll probably be mentioning more about that as we get a little closer. But this is the top 10 stupid moves of World War One, So if you want to make suggestions, you can do that uh, in, on any video. Just reply in the comment section. You can use the link in the description to head over to Discord and go on the channel uh, for video recommendations and post the link there. I want to let you know too that I am almost done editing my next video from France. Uh, and that is my video from the site of Hill 223, which is where Alvin York uh, earned his Medal of Honor late uh, in the war in October of 1918. Excited to bring that story to you. It's going to be one of the longer videos that I did from uh, France because there's a lot of that story to tell. And I tell his whole story from the very beginning uh, before the war even started. So check that out when that comes out here in a few hours. Make sure your notifications are turned on and you're subscribed so you don't miss that when it arrives. Let's dive in. I should mention as well, this is specifically the top 10 stupid moves of World War I in mid-1915 and 1916. They've got multiple stupid moves one, but this is the one that was recommended to me. Also, quick shout out to all of our patrons. Thank you for everything that you do. You make it possible for me to bring you the content that I do. So I appreciate that. A while ago of what we thought were the stupidest moves of the first year of the war by all nations. And it went over pretty well, not just because a lot of people watched it, but also because a lot of people wrote in with things they felt also had a place on the list. It was the kind of interaction we love. And so we're back with Stupid Moves Round 2. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War top list of the 10 stupidest moves of the First World War from the summer of 1915 to the end of 1916. Now remember, you are under no obligation to agree with me, and I urge you to vent your disagreement in the comments. Yes. Okay, here we go. Number 10. Tsar Nicholas takes over personal command of the Russian armies. This happened at the beginning of September 1915, when he appointed himself to replace Grand Duke Nikolai, who was shuttled off to command in the Caucasus. First of all, um, can we just comment on who the heck is this guy he's talking to? Does anybody know? I'm not familiar enough with the Russian military in the world, uh, First World War to know. But who the heck is this crazy tall guy he's talking to? And how tall really is he? Anyway, uh, I'll probably wait until the end of each one of these mistakes to give my reaction to it. Now, the new chief of staff, Mikhail Alexeyev, was really the one in actual charge. But the future of the Tsar, as personal leader, was now tightly bound to the success or failure of his armies. And while there would be some great successes, the people remembered the failures far more easily. Number nine. So, yeah, absolutely true. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, Tsar Nicholas II just has too many things going against him uh, to be committing self-inflicted wounds, which is what he does way too often. Uh, this is a guy who I don't think was a bad person at all. Uh, I think he was, a, he was a good guy. He was certainly a good father and a good husband. Uh, but he made some really, really poor choices as a leader. Uh, a lot of the things that get him deposed in 1917 are self-inflicted wounds. They're, they're decisions he makes that he didn't need to make with everything else that was already going against him and taking personal command of the military. Let's, let's face it, if things had gone well on the Eastern Front and Russia had you know thrown back the Germans and kind of pushed into Germany and won the war, Nicholas would have been hailed as the hero. And I'm sure that's probably what he was thinking. But because things don't go well, it's just one more mark against him that's going to lead to his downfall. Nine is a combo, right? In the spring of 1916, 
the Italian press, and even the French press were full of stories about an Austro-Hungarian buildup of forces on the Italian front that were going to make a huge new offensive against Italy. Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna makes this list for being surprised when that offensive happened. Austro-Hungarian Army Chief of Staff Franz Konrad von Hotzendorf also makes this list for going ahead with the offensive, ironically called the Punishment Expedition, anyhow, even after its plans are announced all over the enemy press. That did not go well for anybody. Yeah, the, the Italian front is like one of the forgotten fronts of the war, right? I mean, people don't talk a lot about it, and we're talking millions of casualties, a lot of it in the exact same place. You have all these multiple battles at Isonzo. Uh, up in these mountains, it's rugged, it's difficult terrain, it's no place to have an army anyway. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the last thing, like he said, a couple mistakes here. Number one is getting surprised uh, by an attack that everybody knows is happening, uh, but then still going forward with the attack and not changing your plans at all when everyone knows it's happening. So stupidity on both sides. There, There's just so many terrible things that happen on this front uh and it's one of those ones that doesn't move a whole lot either way and yet you see these continual casualties just building up building up building up and and austria-hungary could not afford to be losing millions of men on the italian front when they're doing so poorly on the eastern front against the russians as it is uh number eight german army chief of staff eric von falkenhayn's unyielding defense strategy on the western front now it's true he demanded of his men that if they gave up any ground, they must immediately counterattack and retake it no matter the cost. This turned out pretty much as you'd expect it to in hindsight with thousands upon thousands of needlessly dead so I got fired. German soldiers that could have retreated to better defensive positions. Number seven. So it's interesting, yeah, Falkenhayn ends, ends up getting, uh, getting fired <laughs> because of this kind of stuff. But this was the mindset of the day. We've talked about this before, the idea of the cult of the offensive. Uh, that it's always better to attack. And you would think by 1916, it should be painfully obvious how strong defensive positions are in this war and how m many advantages the defenders have. But the idea was, even if you're being attacked, counterattacking is better than putting up a strong defense. And of course, later on in the war, the Germans are going to learn this is not the case and they're going to fall back to the Hindenburg line. Uh, where they're going to build strong defenses and they're going to invite the Allies to attack them. Uh, but at this point in the war, they're still making that same stupid mistake of attack, 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 just hurl your men at the enemy, and you don't have the men to spare to keep doing that. Luigi Cadorna makes the list for a second time. As the Italians delay taking advantage of the momentum of their victory in capturing Gorizia and Mont San Michele. They had the Austrians in disarray and completely on the run. And while the road to Vienna wasn't entirely open, it was at least open a crack, and the Austrian heartland beckoned. Cadorna stalled to strengthen his flanks, and the Austrians had three days to get their defenses in order. The moment was lost. Now yeah, I don't know enough about the Italian front to really comment on that much, but other than to say, imagine how differently the war could have gone if the Italians did break through into the Austro-Hungarian heartland and did even offer some threat toward Vienna. Uh, you know, because Austro-Hungary is going to have to pull troops off the Russian front. The, the Eastern front could collapse. The Germans can't cover the whole line. They're trying to cover the butts of the Austrians on that front. Austria has also lost a lot of men down in Serbia and the Balkans. Uh, of course, once Bulgaria enters the war and things like that, Serbia finally collapses. But, boy, the war could have been very different if that had been the case. I have a feeling that stuff related to the Somme and Verdun are going to be our top ones in this one, but we'll see. Number six, the Germans not rotating their troops at Verdun. Mm. See, at that battle, the Which longest France of the did. war, German losses were just topped up, and the men who survived there just stayed on and on. The French, on the other hand, rotated in fresh divisions and rotated out exhausted ones. You can see what this meant. As the months wore on, the Germans grew ever more weary and demoralized as many of their battalions took casualties of over 100%. While I'm talking about Verdun, I will throw another German error into the list at number five. All right, so let's stop there and talk about Verdun for a second. Verdun is kind of remembered as one of the meat grinders of the war. And having been there now, um, 
it's probably the place more than any other place I've ever stood on planet Earth. And granted, there's a lot of places I haven't been uh, where I have felt the weight of the death and the horror and the destruction that was there. It's just everywhere. And to look into those windows and see the bones of thousands of soldiers from both sides uh, who died there really for very little to change. Um, but yeah, you, you go to the, the Duamont ossuary there and you see the list of all the French uh, regiments who fought there. There's hundreds of them because pretty much every member of the French army rotated into Verdun. Verdun was an awful place. And if you were there for very long, yeah, it would have been really, really rough. There have been studies I know that were done in World War II about the peak effectiveness of soldiers and, and how being on the front line for more than a few weeks just destroyed your psyche. Imagine being at a place like Verdun for months without being rotated to a quieter part of the line. Yeah, absolutely a huge mistake on the Germans' part to not rotate men out of there because they were on the attack constantly. And they're losing tens, hundreds of thousands of men attacking these fortifications of the French. The failure to destroy or at least disrupt traffic on the sacred road. Ooh, now, this yeah. road was the one and only French supply route into Verdun. All of the men ammunition and supplies for Verdun arrived from that road in endless 24-hour traffic. Men stood by on the roadside to push any trucks yep. that broke down off the road so traffic never stopped. In the first few months of the battle, Germany had air superiority there, and yet they did not attack the road. Doing so with even partial success would have crippled the French at Verdun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just imagine you go in and strafe a few vehicles, and now instead of one vehicle that needs pushed off the road, say you, you line up 10 or 12 destroyed vehicles to block that road. It literally was the lifeline to Verdun. And 24-7 pouring in. You cut that off, the French are done. I mean, they are really, really done uh, at Verdun. Huge. You know, it's not something I really thought about, but with air superiority, there's no reason the Germans couldn't have been flying some bombers. They had those big Gotha bombers. They could have been dropping bombs on that road. It's an easy target. You've got men lined up. We saw something like this happen in the Gulf War in 1990-91, uh, where they had this highway uh, of Iraqi vehicles that were just destroyed, and you could just see for miles destroyed vehicles. They could have done that there. Number four the failure of the British and French to coordinate at the Somme. Mm. Well, this lack of coordination was disastrous. Plans would be made, and then attacks of five battalions would happen at completely different times for random reasons, and they would all fail. Artillery from one unit would fail to support its neighbor because it didn't know what was going on. And attacks on areas where there was clearly no breakthrough possible would not be called off. The lack of communication and coordination was staggering in scale. That's one advantage that Germany has on the Western Front throughout the war, is that pretty much the whole Western Front is German. Whereas on the Allied side, you've got the French, and you've got the British, and later on the Americans, and you've got some Russian troops uh, and others. And so there are multiple competing um commands with a uh, desire to be under their own command. You know, the Americans absolutely refused to be under anybody else's command, even though they were kind of under the French command. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of that going on. The reason the Somme was picked in the first place is because that was where the French and British sectors of the Western Front came together was at the Somme. It was not the best place to launch a major offensive, but it was the place where those two armies came together. And so for a joint assault, that's the way, place to go. Uh, of course, Verdun happens a, a couple months before the Somme, and so the French end up committing fewer resources to the Somme. Um, and the French still are the ones who break through on the southern end of the line, but I'm sure there's going to be more about the Somme in this. Number three, over in Mesopotamia, the arrival of the British at Kut al-Amara. Charles Townsend, had led his men up the Tigris River too far for their supplies and reinforcements to follow, completely underestimating the Ottoman opposition. He soon found his army under siege at Kut as the months rolled by and relief repeatedly failed to break through. Starvation finally forced the British to surrender. It was one of the great humiliations in British military history. And coming on the heels of the failure at Gallipoli, which was on our last mm. list, was a huge blow to British pride. Number two. Yeah, so I mean, 
everybody has this pretty poor opinion of the Ottomans at this point. The Ottomans had, had lost some wars that a few centuries earlier they easily would have won, like in the Balkan Wars and things like that. They've been losing territory. They've been plagued by weak leadership for generations. Uh, so for the mighty British Empire to lose at places like Gallipoli and now in, in modern-day Iraq, uh, it was. It was a big blow to the psyche, and it was a big morale boost for the Ottoman Empire. Two, Russian generals Evert and Kuropotkin refused to attack. In the summer of 1916, Russian general Alexei Brusilov's offensive was smashing through the Austro-Hungarian lines like a hot knife through butter, and there was a very real possibility that Austria would be knocked out of the war. Those two other generals, far to the north, had 750,000 men and 75% of the Russian artillery. All they had to do was tie down the Germans in the north to prevent them from reinforcing the Austrians facing Brusilov. They didn't. They did not attack until it was way too late and the moment of possible victory had passed. And it Boy, so often in a war, it's about timing, right? You know, there are times when if things happen just a little sooner uh, or a little later, complete completely changes the outcome of a battle or of a campaign. Uh, and this is a perfect example that the Brusilov offensive was supposed to be timed with the offensives on the West to put pressure at the same time on both fronts because, you know, the central powers have limited ability to cover this ground. And so you're depriving them of the ability to move units back and forth. And part of that means that sometimes you have to hold down units in place. In the American Civil War, this was supposed to happen at the Battle of Fredericksburg, for example, where the attack on Marie's Heights, which everybody remembers as this debacle where the Union just sends wave after wave up the hill to be slaughtered, that was not supposed to be the main attack. That was just to, supposed to hold Longstreet's men in place so they couldn't reinforce on the Confederate right, which is where they were trying to break through Stonewall Jackson's line, and they actually had some success in that. But because they didn't follow up that attack, the diversionary attack turns into a slaughter. Same thing here. You need to attack and hold them so that you can make the breakthrough somewhere else. Number one on this second list of failures, the timing of the Romanian entry mm. into the war. Had Romania entered the war in June 1916 alongside Brusilov's offensive, Austria-Hungary would likely have fallen yeah. whatever the northern Russian generals had done. Yep. Romania, however, did not enter the war until late August, by which time Brusilov's offensive was spent. All four central powers immediately sent forces to invade Romania, who could only count on now exhausted Russia for defensive help. Russia was also forced to extend its front lines for hundreds of kilometers to the south, which would prevent any new Russian offensives for the time being. And when Romania fell, Romanian oil and grain would fall into the central powers' hands at yep. just the time when they needed it most to be able to even continue the war. So there you have it, our top 10 list for now. So yeah, I mean, absolutely 100% uh, agree again. Timing is everything, and a month or two difference changes the outcome. You go from Austria-Hungary being overwhelmed. Imagine if Italy had broken through, if Brusilov's offensive had been more successful, if the Romanians had come at that time. Complete collapse of the Austro-Hungarian front is disaster. But instead, not only do they hold, but now they get oil and grain that they didn't have before, which are desperately needed, and the war is going to be prolonged for another two years. Boy, what a different outcome it could have been. For me personally, though, I still feel like... Oh, I just turned myself off there. I meant to do that. Um, I still feel like it's got to be the Somme for me, and maybe it's because I'm in the West, and so I'm much more of a Western-centric person when it comes to the fronts. Uh, and to me, the Somme is just one of the great disasters of the war, um, at least that first day, because eventually there was some success at the Somme later on. But uh, let me know your thoughts. What do you think of this top 10? What would you add? What would you change? What do you think they got right or wrong? Use the comment section below. Again, thank you to all of our patrons. Grateful for your support. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.